Cyberpunk 2077 is a whole lot of things. It is the most botched AAA release since the infamous Assassin's Creed Unity, it is the buggiest console title since Kingdom Come Deliverance, it is the most overhyped and hence disappointing game since No Man's Sky. It is also a massive blow to the reputation of its developer, CD Projekt Red. Cyberpunk 2077 is a monument to the importance of details and polish in virtual world building and a striking example of how imperfections and faults can obscure even the most vibrant examples of creativity. It is a litany of wasted opportunities and unrealized possibilities. It is an almost textbook example of slapjank with a budget. A controversy at best and a fittingly bitter finale to the year 2020 at worst. But Cyberpunk 2077 is not only that. It is one hell of an engrossing, immersive experience that provides a true sensory overload and masterfully pulls at all sorts of emotional strings. It is a bold, even daring, vision of the near future filtered through decades of real-life pop culture. Simultaneously looking ahead and having its feet firmly planted in the aesthetics of the 1980s, the portrayal of reality in Cyberpunk 2077 strikes an odd balance between the elements of power fantasy and that was mundane. This is achieved with ease that can very rarely be seen in video games. Cyberpunk 2077 is an incredible, captivating ride, a dazzling collection of great ideas interspersed by some truly impressive storytelling and a diverse cast of intriguing characters. It's an experience that stays with you even after all is said and done, an experience that creeps under your skin where it's broading and inspiring. It is an achievement the world building and presentation, because yeah, even despite all the bugs and glitches, Cyberpunk 2077 often looks and sounds like a million bucks. Cyberpunk 2077 is an adventure carried by its atmosphere, and, once again when everything works as intended, the possible levels of immersion are generally staggering. Cyberpunk 2077 is not only an adaptation of the tabletop role-playing game by Mike Pondsmith, but also a passionate love letter to all things low life and high tech. It is Blade Runner, Akira, Neuromancer, Deus Ex, Bubblegum Crisis, Johnny Mnemonic, Judge Dredd, Ghost in the Shell, Battle Angel Alita and Altered Carbon, all combined into its own mixture and the audience gets to be in the middle of this truly incredible mashup. Yeah, Cyberpunk 2077 is a whole lot of things. To a certain extent it's all subjective, after all, the beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. And to some extent, it's all a mixture of the good, the bad and the unfortunate. One's visit to Night City is definitely a complex and complicated affair. Now that the dust and commotion caused by the game's release have seemingly settled a little bit and I myself have spent some time with the PS4 Pro version of Cyberpunk 2077, I would like to add my two cents to this growing pile of Euro dollars while avoiding story related spoilers and sticking mostly to footage from the earlier parts of the adventure. Why? Well, because I can but also because one day Cyberpunk 2077 will probably return to Sony's digital storefront. So, with all that said, hey, I'm Magic, the Tommy Wiseau of YouTube game reviews <laughs> shamelessly jumping on this bandwagon. Welcome to Joints and Games. Good morning, Night City! Yesterday's body count lottery rounded out to a solid and sturdy 30! 10 out of Haywood, thanks to unabated gang wars. One officer down, so I guess you're all screwed. If there is one thing I'm looking for in video games, it is immersion that would allow me to completely lose myself within the virtual world I happen to be visiting. As contradictory and naive as it may sound, when playing a video game I want to be able to forget that I'm playing a video game. What I seek is having adventures, what I seek is feeling like I'm there, what I seek is having the impression that the problems my character is facing are my own problems. Following this logic, I consider titles in the likes of Vampire, The Masquerade, Bloodlines, the Deus Ex games or the Metro series my absolute gem and I think that Kingdom Come Deliverance is one of the greatest achievements of the last generation of gaming. 
I am mentioning this to explain where I'm coming from with my opinions, but also because Cyberpunk 2077 constitutes a truly remarkable feat in this very regard. Consistently presented from the first-person perspective and allowing for the third-person view only during vehicle sections, Cyberpunk 2077 can be, and often is, immersive like a son of a gun. Night City, the main arena of one's adventures in this game, is a sprawling metropolis that walks the fine line between being an awe-inspiring mecca of opportunities and a neon-soaked hellhole where dreams come to die. Part futuristic Los Angeles from Blade Runner, part Neo Tokyo from Akira, part Mega City 1 from Judge Dredd, and part, his very own thing, Night City truly amazes and captivates. Already the simple act of exploring the city, walking down its shady streets, driving down avenues illuminated by the incessant advertisement displays, experiencing the never-ending activity and the perpetual hustle and bustle, already all this brings a lot of entertainment and does wonders when it comes to grounding the audience within the present of reality. Describing Night City as complex or intricately designed would be an exercise in euphemistic expressions. What has been achieved here simply has to be seen in order to be believed. The city is not only vast and varied, as it consists of several distinctly different districts, but it also, and that's probably even more important, feels like a real, lived-in place. It has its clear identity and its unique voice. It has its legends, its lore and its history. Especially the lore and the history of Night City strike me as fascinating. The source books for Mike Pondsmith's original role-playing game have been revised a bunch of times since their inception in 1988 and CD Projekt Red have used these foundations very well. And just like real-life places, Night City is damn proud of whatever it is. Its visual design game is top-notch. The logos, the ads, the gang-related wall art, the fashion, oh the fashion. All this stuff is so awesomely varied and so insanely solid that it doesn't only remind one of the Rocksteady style of the Wipeout series, but it is honestly mind-blowing. Yeah, Night City knows how to impress, that's for damn sure. It is sleazy and obsessed with sex, it is in your face and over the top, it speaks a bunch of languages at once, it smells of onigiri and pierogi, and it sounds like industrial rock mixed with electro and a whole bunch of lovely synth. Have a stroll through Watson at night, listen to the crazy guy on the corner, take some cool pictures using the brilliantly intricate photo mode, look at the posters and the graffiti, you'll tune in before you would even know it. Night City can be beautiful, astonishing even. Filled with references, easter eggs, little nods, cameos and quotations, the city offers a field day for those versed in pop culture and all that's technoir. Your place is in a building not different from a mega block. You can ride a bike that looks like the one used by Canada or drive a car resembling a DeLorean. You can wear a leather jacket like the one Motoko Kusanagi wore or get yourself a gun similar to the TKD Blade Runner blaster. But Night City can be also suffocating and oppressive. Interspersed with numerous shortcuts and back alleys, the city is a behemoth, both in the sense of pure scale and when it comes to a rather astonishing level of details. There is verticality, there are some really amazing interiors and everything appears grounded and well thought through despite being an obvious canvas for a gamified experience. As one would expect, the city is also full of nicely varied vendors ready to sell all sorts of equipment, mods and clothing, service providers specializing in utilitarian body modifications and updates of one's cyberware, as well as dozens upon dozens of side quests and smaller gigs. These smaller gigs are usually simple, one and done affairs, though the actual side quests often turn out to be fascinating rabbit holes with several stages of development, great characters, numerous ways to succeed and often different possible outcomes. Just like in Skyrim or The Witcher 3, the side quests are an essential part of the overall experience and provide a captivating insight into the life of Night City. Sure, not every available job in Cyberpunk 2077 is a winner, and some of the early assignments in the first district seem to carry the stench of baby's first side quest, but the good ones are really good, while the great ones absolutely fucking nail it. 
Wild Night City beacons with its nostalgic neons and majestic skyscrapers of powerful corporations, the surrounding desert is an entirely different story. One could probably argue that this dissonance is only justified. After all, every shiny gem needs a fittingly bleak background in order to shine properly, however the fact that two such vastly different realities can exist next to one another does serve as some food for thought. Depending on your decisions throughout the game and during the initial pre-flight preparation, you will see it all for yourself sooner or later. But yeah, you'll see it all. And speaking of which, now that the stage is set, who are you and what is the mess you've gotten yourself into? Well, you're playing as V. V has come too. A random schmuck from the general area with one of three different possible character backgrounds. You get involved in a really nasty affair and you gotta get to the bottom of it all while staying alive and without losing too much of your damn mind in the process. Is there more to it? Well, of course there is. The plot constantly meanders and surprises, traveling from the rooftops of shiny skyscrapers to the city underbelly of the city, setting the audience face to face with a plethora of great characters and occasionally hitting so hard and so unexpectedly that it's difficult to feel indifferent about it all. There is also Keanu Reeves, whose purpose is to be the snagging voice in your head and, awesomely enough, his role in this whole thing is much more substantial than just looking cool in promotional trailers. At the same time, the less said the better and I will limit my comments to stating that this is one right worth taking. It is a story that demands your attention and one that rewards your investments, be it with some cool items, additional knowledge about the world, totally new adventures on the site or with stuff that can be only labeled as cool and unexpected. While Cyberpunk 2077 is a title vastly different to The Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt, it is equally, if not even more, competent in getting under the user's skin with its themes and the questions it demands answers for. So yeah, there are demands, but what about facilitating them? I have referred earlier to Night City as to a canvas, and this expression wasn't only an attempt at sounding fairly intelligent. Cyberpunk 2077 is a role-playing game with strong elements of the immersive sim genre, so this metropolitan area is designed to be both a convincing real-life location and an environment that accommodates various gameplay possibilities. And those, while not groundbreaking or trailblazing or whatever, are at the very least rock solid. Depending on the build use, the things at stake and the opposition in front, one can sneak or hack their way around, one can pick locks or use backdoors, one can simply go into Stone Cold Steve Austin mode and obliterate whatever fools they encounter, or one can use some kind of a creative combination of all the above. There is also a lot of talking, investigating, scanning and connecting all sorts of dots. Some of the available ways to go around things are simply more elegant or efficient than others and it's mostly a matter of discovering what's really on the menu and making the appropriate choices. I mean, you can engage in a shootout with some goons, but you can also hack a brain or two and thin the ranks from the inside. You can tell someone to go fuck themselves, but you can also play things cool and benefit on the long run. The important thing here is that throughout your time with Cyberpunk 2077 you can do a whole lot of different things in a whole lot of different ways and the game is usually well prepared for each of those scenarios. Sure, neither of this is truly revolutionary stuff, but it goes without saying that it's really impressive how the available gameplay options gel with their setting in Cyberpunk 2077. Ah, there is also Braindance, a tool based in virtual reality that pretty much constitutes Cyberpunk's answer to the Esper technology seen in Blade Runner. However, whereas Esper is designed to analyze photos and to allow investigators to search a room without even being there, Braindance is all about going through someone's memories. It's a neat tool. Yeah, when things work as designed, Cyberpunk 2077 is a real treat. The main story pushes things forward at a nice engaging pace, gradually introducing consecutive parts of the city and its surroundings, while the accompanying jobs and hustles do a rather splendid job at additionally fleshing things out. The presentation can be genuinely impressive and even when it falls short at times, the artistic vision is incredibly strong here. Music is totally sublime, 
There are over two hours of original OST stuff composed by Marcin Przybyłowicz, P.T. Adamczyk and Paul Leonard Morgan and there are dozens of licensed tracks of all sorts, so there is certainly no lack of variety in this regard either. The game is also a rather thought-provoking study of at least several reoccurring themes. There is the issue of the nagging voice inside one's head, a voice of criticism and doubt, a voice that sometimes engages in discussions and disputes. There is the underlying theme of the daily hustle and of being able to notice the extraordinary in the mundane. Hell, there are some serious religious and philosophical tones in here as well, and the back and forth they generate is more often than not handled with surprising maturity and complexity. Sure, not everything pans out as intended, and sometimes one simply wishes for even more meat on those bones. But when things do work out as they're supposed to, Cyberpunk 2077 is one hell of an incredibly immersive adventure that is most certainly worth experiencing. It's too bad that this ain't always the case. Not on the PS4 Pro, anyway. By now, the state in which Cyberpunk 2077 has shipped is a subject of memes, corporate lawsuits and official actions of the Polish Consumer Protection Agency. It goes without saying that something went horribly wrong in the process, that CD Projekt Red's management acted like they believed their own hype, that an unfinished product has been shipped and that those responsible for quality assurance at Sony have shut the bed by allowing the game to appear on last-gen consoles in the state it did. In my opinion, this is one of those situations when no one really looks good when you think about it, and it's a real shame that so much of the developer's hard work is currently being buried under issues, controversies and a hype that has long since turned from enthusiastic to overly negative. So, with this out of the way, and with this particular subject being left at that statement, how do things actually look on the PlayStation 4 Pro home entertainment system thing? The answer features a fair dose of duality, as it consists of both good and bad news. The good news is that things are not nearly as bad as one could be expecting at this point. The game runs at around 30 frames per second, and for most time it manages to keep things relatively stable. I was also very surprised with the rather short initial loading times, however I would definitely prefer them to be even twice as long if it meant better overall performance of the rest of the title. So, things load somewhat fast and they run fairly smoothly. Now is this consistent? Not at all. And here come the bad news. Jump into a faster car or have a run around the block and sooner or later some, usually minor but still, cracks will start to appear. Sometimes it is just a character model that is still loading its details when you approach them. Sometimes the AI routines freak out or you get to see an NPC or two spawning out of thin air. But sometimes it's the entire lighting system of a given scene that needs a few seconds in order to kick off properly. This effect is not always consistent and many a time everything will be mostly fine. But when these issues happen, they are certainly noticeable and they certainly do take away from the immersive experience. There are issues with scripting and things not triggering properly at times, which can bring events to a sudden and unnatural stop. Once again, this doesn't happen always, but it does happen often enough that one feels compelled to regularly save the game state, which in turn is another little nuisance that jolts one out of the experience. Hell, there can be issues with saving the game. Cyberpunk 2077 has crashed for me once during saving and has managed to corrupt the save file in the process. Even though this issue has been supposedly fixed since then, knowing about it still kind of forces me to alternate between at least a couple of different save files in order to avoid losing the accumulated progress. Because you never know, right? In all honesty, these issues baffle me. How could bugs of such severity pass either the internal or external testing? How could such things have not been considered as showstoppers? I'm baffled, because that's kind of exactly what these issues do. They stop an otherwise great show dead in its tracks. The list of problems is varied, ranging from hilarious through annoying to immersion breaking. Water looks like trash. Underwater, even worse. Physics freak the fuck out for no reason. Objects and decorations spawn on top of existing objects and decorations. Sound channels get mixed up the wrong way. 
parts of the UI remain on the screen in situations when they should have already disappeared, there is a lot of pop-up and so on and so forth. These issues vary between versions of the game and sometimes seem to be dependent on phases of the moon or something like that. But on a more positive note, they are being gradually ironed out by the developer. Personally, I don't find all these glitches to be that much of a problem, as it is usually a question of reloading one's last save game in order for things to go back to normal, and I am sure that this stuff will be repaired in the coming months, but it doesn't change the objective fact that the current state of things is marred by issues that should not have place in a AAA title. And speaking of facts, the fact of the matter is that we can talk circles about the subject and it won't change that in the technical sense, Cyberpunk 2077 could and should have panned out better than it has. When comparing the game to other giants available on the platform, to titles in the likes of Red Dead Redemption 2 or Horizon Zero Dawn, Cyberpunk 2077 appears somewhat sluggish, and its performance falls much closer to titles like Kingdom Come Deliverance or the open world sections of Metro Exodus. As far as console ports go, this title should have been moved to the next generation of hardware. Sure, people would have been mad then as well, but even on the Pro version of the PS4, the game can be only considered playable or enjoyable with several important asterisks. Personally, I find this to be acceptable, albeit disappointing. As for you, I think that you know best your own breaking point. I said earlier that I am not that concerned with the many, many glitches of Cyberpunk 2077 and that still stands. They will be ironed out, so fuck it. What I am more concerned with are the shortcuts that the developers took in order to maintain playable performance on the PS4 Pro. Personally, I doubt if this can be properly addressed without tanking the frame rate and creating other issues, but I guess that we'll see. But what I am talking about here? Well, first of all, Night City, this bustling metropolis that never sleeps, is eerily empty. Now, don't get me wrong, there are NPCs wandering the streets. They're doing their things, chatting about this and that, chilling at bars, getting mugged by AI goons and all that good stuff. But there is not nearly enough of them. Sure, it's not like Night City appears to be under curfew or whatever, but things should be busier and much more crowded. This becomes especially noticeable during the scripted fragments of quests that call for either larger gatherings of people or increased traffic, because then, when things are populated correctly, one suddenly notices that hey, things are usually not like that. AI is a problem in the entire game. Unless things are scripted or are happening within a fairly enclosed area, the AI is inconsistent at best and, shall we say, uh, lobotomized in worst cases. Why hello there fellow police officers, all good in the hood? Alright, 10-4. And yeah, there is also the stuff that either got cut or got implemented in its most basic form. Like, why don't have the three available live backgrounds a greater influence on the development of the main story? The stuff that's in is great, but come on guys, give me more. Why aren't the hacking mechanics more expanded upon? What's currently on offer is alright, but it does feel like a combination of Watch Dogs and the 2012 Syndicate remake. I think that given its subject nature, Cyberpunk 2077 should be setting some new standards here instead of playing catch-up. Why is the awesome Metro network from the trailer and promo graphics a non-entity during one's escapade throughout the city? Why does V have an apartment, but not much can be done with the place? Why isn't it possible to change one's haircut during the game? Why can't I modify or upgrade my many, many rides? Why am I the only person in Night City who rides a motorcycle outside of cutscenes or quests? Why does the crafting system feel so tacked on and ultimately unnecessary? Why is the UI designed the way it is? Why so many functions of the game aren't properly explained? Why is cyberpsychosis such an issue for all these poor maniacs I have to catch like Pokemon, but when it comes to me, I can crawl myself the fuck out and even get a trophy for that achievement without suffering from any side effects whatsoever? Why don't my futuristic cyber optics have a night vision mode? Or better yet, why can't I have a goddamn light source of some sort? 
It's supposed to be the future, right? And yet I am forced to live in the dark like it's World War II. Come on, it's a small thing, but it's a ridiculous omission. Why can't I sit at a bar or call a taxi to get a ride to a waypoint? The functionality is clearly there as this happens during missions, so it's not that I'm asking for the impossible here. Another thing, it is awesome that Cyberpunk 2077 has so many different clothes, but why doesn't wearing the colors or a uniform of a particular gang or a faction influence the way I'm being perceived, at least initially? I mean goddamn Greedfall has this functionality, and Greedfall, with all respect to Greedfall and all the spiders behind it, isn't exactly pretending to be top tier, now is it? Or why doesn't the TV have more content? Already getting some public domain movies in there would do wonders. I did it in this video and it's grand, I'm telling you. Speaking of grand, consider the aspect of general aesthetics of this world. Without spoiling anything, the game occasionally refers to certain events that took place some 50 years before this adventure and the audience actually gets to see them. But neither the city itself nor its fashion or its technology seem to change that much throughout this half of century. And it's weird, because it's been 50 years, but everything remained unchanged in its retro-futuristic 80s style throughout time? Hmm, I don't know. Sure, some passage of time can be observed, however one wonders if more wasn't planned in this regard. Anyway, let's move on. So, why aren't there more celebrity cameos? I'm usually not a big fan of such solutions, but it is well known that Cyberpunk 2077 already has some of that, and let's face it, Night City is the perfect place for some famous or semi-famous faces, so why not go crazy? I mean, get John Carmack and let him do all the talking about rogue AIs and neural networks. Get Al Jorgensen from Ministry, he looks like he lives in cyberspace anyway. Or hell, get Sasha Gray. Sasha Gray makes everything and everyone better. Wait, everyone? EVERYONE! Alright. Listen, I am probably missing some things here, but my point is that over time all these cuts and omissions become more and more noticeable and while it is perfectly possible to simply ignore them and go on with the cool parts of the overall experience, every now and then this stuff makes you think long and hard about the trials and tribulations of Cyberpunk's development. And it is all a real shame if you ask me, because for every single thing that Cyberpunk does well, Hell, sometimes exceptionally well, it does at the very least one thing incorrectly or insufficiently. But then again, for every blunder it suffers from, it delivers at least one thing very well or goddamn fucking exceptionally. While certain elements of Cyberpunk 2077 are most certainly great, this greatness carries some of the DNA of other flawed endeavors. The DNA of Daggerfall, Bloodline and Trespasser. So, with all that on the table and out in the open, why do I find myself so engrossed in this adventure? Why do I enjoy Cyberpunk 2077 so goddamn much? Well, the answer is fairly simple, at least in my opinion. Underneath all this mess there is a really amazing game that manages to keep one glued to the screen despite its many flaws, limitations and imperfections. There are easily over 200 hours of gameplay for those willing to invest their time in all the side content and a solid 35 to 40 hours for those interested mainly in the main dish. And that's a whole lot of bang for the buck. There is action and drama, there is mystery and comedy and the level of detail is often absolutely breathtaking. The heart and passion of the developers are clearly on display here and there are no microtransactions, no loot boxes, no season passes or any of that shit. Also, keeping in mind the history of patches and support for the titles from the Witcher series, I am allowing myself to be carefully optimistic regarding my hopes of CD Projekt Red still being able to turn things around for them. Because hey, if No Man's Sky did it, then stars are the limit. Literally. Personally, I feel that the good outweighs the bad enough to give Cyberpunk 2077 a chance even on the PS4 Pro. Where the game falls short in terms of performance, it excels in art direction. Where it disappoints with the depth of certain elements, it nails it when it comes to being a title in which you play a role. I could go on like that for many hours. 
if there is one thing I would like you to remember from this whole rant, it is that underneath all the issues and the questionable decisions made by people in suits, there is an incredible ride in here. A ride that I personally rate at it's a flawed as hell but equally impressive title out of 10. Then again, that's the whole thing with opinions. Everyone has one and I am sure that you will reach your own conclusions. Huh, 